morning, church. Um, I'm reading from the um, NIV and um, Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. It's um, the Lord Jesus speaking. Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, family. Good morning. Thank you, Uamlion, for reading the scripture for us. And thanks to Jake and the uh, worship team for leading us wonderfully into worship. And thanks to Bethany for also hosting us like a champ. And yeah, my name is Shiami, and I've got the privilege of standing in front of you this morning and share with you what I believe God wants us to hear on this wonderful morning. Now you may ask, what is it that qualifies me to stand in front of you and speak on this wonderful morning? And all I can say is nothing. Nothing qualifies me to stand in front of you. Um, I've just been asked to come and stand in front of you. Uh, uh, so I, I am part of uh, the preaching team for this wonderful family, and I've been so for a while now. And I was looking at everyone talking about the question of the day. That No, that must have struck a nerve because people were having a lot of fun. Uh, and, and I shared, I would like to share mine, if you don't mind. Mine also just happened a couple of weeks ago. Obviously, among many things, you know, most people would be, going where Ben went, and I know that if I don't go there, then uh, Parliament will be very crossed with me. <laughs> but forgive me, Parliament. Uh, we'll share that story next time. For this morning, for me, it also was the Springboks versus, the Island, uh, versus Ireland at Loftus. I don't know if you guys were watching that, but I wasn't watching that, I was there. And I can tell you, when we were singing the national anthem, the goosebumps all over. Goosebumps, I can even feel it now. But yeah, that was, that was wonderful, um, a wonderful moment for me, very memorable. I have been to several rugby games, and I've watched several rugby matches. I have played in some, not professionally, um, but that one was, was something different. So... A couple of weeks ago, we had a, a men's meeting. And in that men's meeting, we talked about resting. Resting for our bodies, finding rest for our bodies. And we spoke as men of the importance of taking time out just to rejuvenate, taking, time to, taking some time out to re-energize. On that Friday, uh, Saturday morning, we spoke about the need for us as men to take time out and rest. The fact that sometimes we want to work so hard to bring things into the family and food for the family that we forget to take care of ourselves. And eventually we crumble and fall and the family is left behind with no one. The following day, being the Sunday, Lesero came here and spoke about the sluggard. You know? So the previous day we spoke about resting, the following day we were speaking about the sluggard. Meaning that there needs to be a time where you strike a balance between resting and becoming a sluggard. If you're not careful, you will rest until you become a sluggard. But this wonderful morning, uh, the title, if you are one of those that like having uh, titles for the messages, is uh, no RSVP required. No RSVP required. I don't know, what, what comes to mind for you whenever you receive an invitation, be it to a wedding or to a party, be it to a celebration of something uh, significant in someone else's life? What, what comes to your mind? Is it what you're going to dress? You know, the attire? Is it, is it who am I going to go with? Is it, is it uh, maybe me and my partner have had differences and I'm not seeing eye to eye. How is the commute from here to where we are invited going to be? Uh, is, or is it, is it, is it, is it uh, am I going to be able to get along with, with everyone that I'm going to be sitting around with at the, at the table? 
how will my experience be at that particular party that I've been invited? And obviously, you'll be required to RSVP. But this morning, no RSVP required. No RSVP required. Some of us, when we receive invites, we might be overjoyed by the fact that, oh, we are up there on the list of friendships. That is why we got the invite. I cracked the list. That's why I am going to attend. Some of us may be even grateful just to, to be noticed, to be seen. There is an invitation that is forever open and extend to us all. An invitation like no other. Are you sick? You're still invited. Are you ashamed of something that you have done? You are still invited. That is an open invitation. Before we go any further than far, as they say, allow me to pray for us and, and just put our hearts in a place of, of hopefully recep uh, being receptive. Heavenly Father God, we, we are thankful for your invitation, Lord. We are thankful, oh Father God, that you have looked at us and you saw that we needed the, the invite. And here we are, oh Father God, saying, Lord God, we accept your invitation. Our hearts are open, oh Father God, for you to, to deposit whatever you want to deposit in us. Here we are, oh Father God, saying, speak through me, oh Father God. I'm availing myself as a vessel, as a plate, oh Father God, upon which your children, oh Father God, may die in. Lord God, I pray, oh Father God, that may you speak to each and every one's heart including mine, O oh Father God, this wonderful morning. That even the ways that I do not say, O oh Father God, that you want your children to know, O oh Father God, that may you proceed and speak to them directly to, the, to your children, O oh Lord of all creation. Speak to their hearts, for they are open, O oh Father God. Here we are, opening up ourselves, O oh Father God, to hear from you, to listen from you, O oh Father God, to listen to what you have to say, Lord. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. There may be a thought that just crossed your mind right now that may not necessarily be in line with what you think and believe that, you know, would be a thought from Christ. And if that thought has just crossed your mind, you're still invited. Have you broken a promise? You are invited. Have you broken a vow? You're still invited. Are you considering yourself unworthy to be invited? Or you have been told that you are unworthy, or you're too young, or you're too old to accept the invite? Well, the good news is you're still invited. Are you weary from the trials of this world? Are you weary from worry? You are still invited. The invitation says to you, come as you are. Just as you are. Dirty as you are. Clean as you are. You are invited. You are invited. We are invited to come to Jesus even when we are burdened by failed relationships. When we are burdened by sicknesses burdened by shame from past sins, he still calls us to call, he still calls us to come to him. Even when we are burdened by rash decisions, when we could have taken a moment to think a bit before we acted, still he says, come to me. Come to me. When you've tried to solve God problems, I'm talking about those problems that have nothing to do with you, but only God can solve when you've tried everything that you can and still failed, God still says, yes, you tried to be me, but you are not me, but I'm still inviting you to come to me. You are still invited. When burdened by betrayal from loved ones, he is saying, come to me, lay your burdens at my feet. When you're weary from trying to mend shattered dreams, he is saying, come to me. You are invited. The invitation does not consider how close you are to the host. 
In actual fact, the more remote your relationship is to the host, the more, it, it, the, the more relevant the invite is to you. When you feel you are far away from Christ, he's saying, actually, it is you that I want. It is you that I'm inviting to come close to me. It is you that I want. <laughs> but guess what? There will always be opposition to the invite. There will always be someone that comes to you and says, no, you're not worthy to receive the invite. Not you. Do you know what you did last night? You are not worthy to come to an, and accept this particular invite. Oh, you think nobody else knows about that secret that you're keeping? Definitely not you. You cannot accept this invite. There are those that always seem to be competing with you. That says you are not worthy. That no, no, it cannot be you. <laughs> you just lied. It cannot be you. You just stole. It cannot be you. You just treated someone badly and had evil thoughts about someone. It cannot be you. Let me give you an analogy. When we came in, in, in this building this morning, as you entered the gate, there was no one there. Right? And you entered the building and you found everyone in here. Sometimes there will be an enemy sitting at the gate of you accepting the invitation of the wall that you've been invited to, saying to you, no, remember, you are not worth it. You shouldn't go in there. Not you. Somebody else can, but no, definitely not you, for I know you. Right? He will be working with you until the place where you have to enter, because he cannot enter, because he has not accepted the invitation. But you may have accepted the invitation. And there is nothing that should stop you from entering when you have been invited. You see, if, if there, there, there are movies that you'll see bouncers standing at the door, stopping people from entering into whatever party, saying, hey, where is your invite? I don't see your name on the list. Right? For us, the invitation says, I should say to the bouncer, check again. Check again, for my name has been written at the beginning of ages because I have been invited. There was no need for me to RSVP because I have been invited by the host, not by the friend of the host, by the host who knows me by my first name. You have been invited, and so have I. When we are burdened by the concerns of tomorrows, we are still invited. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Are you tired? Are you tired of worrying about the things of this world? Tired of worrying as to what you are going to eat? Tired of worrying as to when you saw the next job coming. He's saying, come to me and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. I will give you rest even from the boss who always sees the mistakes you do in everything. The friend that always wants to compete against you. You did not qualify to be invited. You are invited in whatever shape or form that you are in. Jesus is inviting us to a place of true rest. Like the woman at the well, he is saying to us, come to me and I will give you a cup and drink and you will never thirst again. Brothers, sisters, we are invited to a place of true rest. A place of true rest. And you may ask, what exactly am I being invited to? There is a discipleship journey triangle that we like to show individuals. This is what we are invited to. We are invited to knowing God, to know his word, to encounter him in worship. We are invited to encountering God. 
He's the one that is inviting us and he says, come to me. Not to somewhere else. Not to some things that you need to do in order to get approval from me. He says, come to me. We are invited by the master to the master. We are invited. But what are we invited to? What is it that exactly he's inviting us to? I understand that he says, come to me, but why must I come to him? What is it that I can, what, what is it, yeah, what exactly is it that one may ask, I'm invited to? I believe that we are invited to learn from Jesus. You see, once we get to the host and we sit with the host and we talk to the host, we get to know what makes the host tick. He wants us to be like him, to teach us himself. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And you see, Jesus recognizes the burdens that we may be carrying and walking around with. He says, I have seen you. I know what struggles you're going through, but I'm inviting you to come and learn from me. And he is not aloof to what we are going through. There is no situation that you, might be going, that you might be going through that he is not aware of. That is the reason why he is inviting us to him, to learn from him. In Hebrews 11, I mean in Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16, he says, For we do not serve a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He sees everything that you're going through. He can sympathize with what you're going through. He knows what you're going through and still he's inviting us. He knows our shortcomings and still he's inviting us to come to him. He's inviting us to take his yoke to trade our sorrows and shame for his yoke which is light and burden and, 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 and his burdens are easy to, uh, to carry. Now, one of the things that I struggled with while preparing this message, was, it was too close to home. You know? There are certain messages that come and you, you, God speaks to you, but this, this one was just a bit tiny too close to home. And, and in preparing it, and I was asking myself, what is it that God you want us to learn from you? And there are three aspects that I believe and I feel that you know, we, we, should, we should think about and ponder about on this morning. And this is not to say these are the only three things that Jesus wants us to learn from him. But the first thing that I think is very important that I think we can learn from Christ is forgiveness. It's being forgiving to others. Being married to my girlfriend uh, for just over 12 years, I have experienced the beauty of forgiveness early on. And I understood that if there wasn't forgiveness, definitely she would not have borne with me. Forgiveness is one of the most important things that we can ever have in a relationship. And most of us are suffering from unforgiveness. And we can learn forgiveness from Jesus Christ. Luke uh, Feldbrach says the following about forgiveness. Forgiving people can help us heal emotionally and move on from past hurts. When you hold on to anger, resentment, and other negative emotions towards others, it can lead to stress, anxiety, or even physical health problems. Forgiveness can help us release those negative emotions and allow us to feel more at peace. You see, when we choose to forgive, it requires us to confront our own emotions and values. It can, help us it can help us learn from the past experiences. It can provide an opportunity to reflect and introspect, leading to greater self-awareness and personal development. Forgiving people often requires us to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and try to understand their perspectives. This can help us to become more empathetic, compassionate towards others, which can have a positive impact 
on our relationship and interactions with others. Forgiveness can help us to provide a sense of healing or closure to painful or traumatic experiences. It can help us move on from the past and experience the present and future, allowing us to, give, to live more fully in the present. You see, forgiveness is important for building trust between people because it demonstrates willingness to help, willingness to let go of past issues and move forward with a renewed sense of respect and understanding. When we forgive someone, we show that we are willing to give them a second chance, to work towards trusting them, and we are willing to continue pursuing a more positive relationship. This act of forgiveness can help us break down barriers of fear, doubt, suspicion, that can erode trust between two individuals. That is why it is important to, for us to learn forgiveness from God. And if that is not even enough, even when Christ taught his disciples how to pray, in Matthew 6, verse 12, what does he say about forgiveness? Forgive us our debts as we forgive those of our debtors. Now, sometimes we just glance past this particular aspect of the Lord's Prayer. But imagine if indeed Christ was forgiving you based on the manner in which you are forgiving others. How forgiving are you? How forgiving are we? If we are holding on to others' transgression against them and not forgiving them, yet go to Christ and say, I want you to forgive me. But I said, Lord, forgive me my sins as I forgive those who sins against me. We can learn to truly forgive like Christ forgave. Forgiveness is both private and public. In private, every day as we pray, we must choose to forgive. Remember the parable that Christ gave of somebody who went to give an offering and, and he said, if you are there trying to give an offering and you remember that there is somebody else that I have not settled with, leave your offering there. Go back, sort it out, and then come back. We are invited to learning from Christ. We are invited to learn to forgive. In Matthew 18, verse 21, Peter asked, how many times must I forgive? Seven times? And Jesus said, I do not say forgive seven times, but 77 times. And this nearly says, don't keep records of the number of times that you're forgiven. I know it's very difficult sometimes for those in marriages. As there are parties that have a tendency of keeping record of every single wrong thing that we, the masculine individuals, happen to, to make. But this is what it says. Don't keep count. Don't keep record of the number of times that you're forgiven. Forgive. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, he looked at the very same people for whom he was giving his life, whose sins he bore. They mocked him, they spat at him, they whipped him, they gambled for his clothes, they hung him on the cross. As he hung there, mortal body waning and failing, the pain excruciating, dehydrated and weak in body, he looked at them. The very same people that hung him on the cross, the very same people that whipped him, flesh tore flesh from his body. He looked at them, and still he said, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. The level of forgiveness of seeing the people that are hating you, close to you, and still choosing to forgive them, still choosing to say, God, don't hold this against them, for they know not what they are doing. Learn from Jesus. Forgive those situations that you think are too, too tough to forgive. But look at what Christ did on the cross. As he lay there, forgive them, Lord. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they are doing. We are to learn to forgive. 
we are to learn to forgive. If we are to learn from him, we get to appreciate the blessings of forgiveness. We get to understand that the situation we've been holding on to, not wanting to let go, is not worth it. Is there someone that we can think of now that you should forgive? Maybe it's time to make that choice to forgive. Maybe it's time to let go. Make a mental note that after the service, you're just going to call whoever it is that you need to forgive and just let them know. I have been forgiven much and I'm extending that gratitude to you as well. Many of my sins have been forgiven and now I will forgive you. Now it doesn't mean that I have to be close to you, but I am forgiving you. I am choosing to let go of the unforgiveness, of the hurt that has been holding me down. I'm choosing to let go. I'm choosing to forgive. The second thing that I think that God wants us to learn, or that Jesus that we can learn from Jesus, is to love God and love our neighbors. To love God and to love our neighbors. Uh, Rudolf, if, if, if you may, please show us that um, triangle again. Second thing that we can learn is the heart of God. The heart of God is to loving him and loving our neighbors. Loving those that are around us. When asked which commandment was the most important, Jesus said, in Matthew 22, verse 36 to 39. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like this, You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, most of us say that we love God. But how can we love God if he's still hating other people around us? How can we extend the heart of God when we're not extending the very same heart of God to those that are around us, even those that are hating us? We are called to love God and to love our neighbors. When we accept the invite um, to accept, when, when we accept the invite and accept Jesus' teaching, we learn how to truly love. To love God above all and love those that are around us. Even on the face of it, we may absolutely have nothing in common. You see, the society that we are currently living in is very individualistic. It is all about me, and me and my family, me and my small tribe. That is what we are living into now, the current society that we are living into. Our children don't even know our neighbor's children. They can't even um, have, leave their house to go play with the neighbor's children that are living three, down, three, three, you know, three houses down. Yes, I understand and I accept that we cannot truly know our neighbors nowadays. We can never really know our, their intentions. But here is a proposition. If, or let me put it this way, who then is my neighbor that I should love as myself? Look around you. You will see your neighbor. Look around you. This is an environment where you can love your neighbor. Get to know your neighbor. Get to interact with your neighbor. We often find ourselves in the body of Christ not wanting to interact with anyone at church. I just walk in just as the worship starts. And as soon as I hear the benediction, I'm out of here. For some of us, we don't even like at all the environment that we create here to interact with other people, the question of the day. Because I have to talk to someone else. I'd rather not talk to anyone and just keep it to myself. Or I'd rather not talk to anyone that I haven't spoken to before. I would always go to that particular one person that I know. Because safety. But how do you learn to love your neighbor 
if only you select who is your neighbor and there are other neighbors around you and you walk away from them and are not showing the same courtesy, the same kind of love that Christ has shown to you. Even if I don't make it to church, no one else will know because my neighbor doesn't know me. In John 13, verse 34 to 35, this is Jesus speaking. A new command I give you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also love one another. By this, people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Do people know that you are the disciple of Christ? Have you shown the love of Christ to anyone to the extent that nobody else who, or that anyone else that comes across you and interacts with you would know there is something different about this one? There is a, a, some peace and love that, that, is, that is beyond merger. Have you experienced that love from your fellow brother or sister? Have you extended that love to a fellow brother or sister? We are called to love. Fam, we need to move beyond our self-interest and start learning and leaning or start learning to love those around us in a manner that will bring Christ, in a manner that will bring glory to Christ. Our interactions need to move beyond the borders of a Sunday morning. We need to transcend our differences and create a true cultural, a transcultural family or community. Yes, I may be poor and broke, Yes, I may not meet your social standing. I may not share the same culture as you. But if I call you brother on a Sunday morning, why am I not calling you a brother on a Monday, on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday, on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday? If I, if I have the courage to call you my brother or my sister in this building, what stops me from calling you my brother and my sister outside this building? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. <laughs> but you see, Jesus takes it a little bit higher and deeper. He says in Luke 6, 27 and 28, But I say to you who hears, if you are listening now, I say to you, Jesus says, who hears, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Loving our neighbors doesn't mean only loving those that we get along with. Loving our neighbor calls us to a deeper sacrifice, self-sacrifice. Loving even those that treat us badly. That is what we are called to. Jesus loved those that crucified him. And he prayed for them to be forgiven. Are there somebody else that has been treating you badly that you have been holding a grudge against? You know, you know uh, I was watching a certain video the other day of somebody who came across their childhood bully. Sitting down, being, uh, having, uh, trimming their hair. And all the memories, I guess, of all the bullying came back. And he was ready for a fight until he realized that the bully was even, looked even bigger and stronger than he, he was. But he, what I'm saying here is, our love for our neighbors shouldn't only be extended to those that we get along with. Our love for our neighbor should be extended to everyone, even those that we do not, li we do not like. Our love should not be dependent on how we feel about somebody else. Our love should be borderless. Our love should be colorless. Our love should be formless. Our love should be pure, as the love of Christ is pure. We should extend the same. That is what we are called. We are invited to learn to love God and to learn to love our neighbors. We learn all those things through his word. We learn all those things through his word. 
The third thing that I believe that we can learn from accepting the invitation to learn from Christ is humility. We can learn humility. Sometimes we don't like people because we are too proud. Because if we are around certain kind of people, they either remind us of what we do not have, or we feel they don't deserve to be in the same space as us because of how they look, because of how they dress, because of their accent. Sometimes we feel we are beyond other people. But look at Christ, fam. He left the heavens and came to those that did not deserve his presence, and he loved them still. Humility. We learn to be humble if we accept, the Christ, if we accept Christ. We are invited to learning to be humble. If we are seen to be interacting with certain people or certain type of people, sometimes we feel as though they, we may lose our social standing, our prestigious seats in the high places. We forget that Jesus Christ left his throne of glory for you and me, who did not deserve for the master to offer such great sacrifice. We forget that on that day on the cross, God looked at Christ and he saw our sinful selves. He looked at him and he saw all the sins that so heavily deigned and disdained us. And now he looks at you and I and he sees his one and only begotten son. All because of his humility. All because he let go of his kinship. Just so we can be restored. Our relationship can be restored to the Father. In Matthew 23, 8, 11 to 12, Jesus taught, The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And, and we need to differentiate, I believe, humility from weakness. When I am humble, it does not mean I'm weak. Somebody said that humility is strength under control. Humility is acknowledging who you are, knowing who you are, and being self-assured in who you are, and knowing that you don't need anyone else to prop you up because you have been invited. There was no need for an RSVP. Just as you are, you have been invited. Humbly saving people in the name of Christ is the greatest indication of one's humility. Jesus is lowly in spirit and he's calling us to be humble. The invitation is out and now what? We have learned from Christ. We know what we can learn from Christ. We can learn to forgive. We can learn to love God and we can learn to love others. We can learn to be humble. Now what? What should I do then? What should I do then? How do I respond to all these that I have just heard? Well, you accept and you rest. You accept the invitation and you rest in his bosom. You accept his invitation and you rest. When Jesus spoke about rest, he means in every situation. He has the ability to rest even when chaos is raging, even in the storms. Do you not believe me? Let's go to Matthew 8, verse 23 to 27. When he got into the boat, Remember, he's talking, to, he is with his disciples who have accepted the invitation to follow him. When he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And here he is with them. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a storm on the sea. 
so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was what? Asleep in the storm. You see, when you have accepted the invitation from Christ, you are able to sleep in the storm. Even when things are not going well in your life or around you, still because you know who you have around you, because you, who, you know who you are working with, you can still sleep in the storm. What's bothering you right now? What storms are raging in your life right now? When you accept the invite, you can sleep amidst the storm. You can rest in the storm, knowing that he who is the author and finisher of our faith has you covered on both sides, up and down, fully covered. Even when it hurts, you can rest in him. You can rest in him. We struggle sometimes to sleep when we think of, or that we have forgot to lock the doors. The disciples' fear shows the lack of faith and failure to recognize who surrounds them. We've been living in our house now for 10 years. And in that 10 years, we have had two break-ins. And in those times, we were asleep. The last one was uh, late last year, right? Yeah, late last year. Got in, took every uh, electronic that we had in our study and TVs and all of that. And I think for me, this is what made this particular um, message a bit difficult to prepare. The fact that I am finding myself, yes, I have now since, you know, upgraded the security a bit, but still, if I am sitting in the house and I'm wondering as to whether I have locked the garage, I would be restless. I wouldn't sleep peacefully. Right? And for those that have been victims of crime, you would know how uneasy it is to rest while you know that you're not necessarily in control of what is happening around you. But here, when you accept invitation of Christ, we learn that Christ, even through the storms, he slept. They took what they took. God has restored what he restored. Because he's able. Because he's around us. There's a song by is it Michael W. Smith that says, you may think that I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Fam, we are surrounded by him. We are surrounded by Christ. We are surrounded by Christ. When we accept the invitation to rest, we should not be afraid of what is happening, of the storm, or the storms around us. When we have accepted the invitation, then we are free in Christ to take on his yoke and let go of the yoke of slavery and the yoke of people pleasing. But now there's another thing that we also need, and that is to find rest for our souls. To find rest for our souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. You find rest for your soul in accepting the invitation to Christ. Letting go of the illusion of control and leaning on him in everything we do. As believers, we are not granted immunity from life storms. But we have the choice as to how we respond to the life storms. Our natural tendencies might be to run around frantically looking for help and trying to find and save ourselves from troubles. We can either respond frantically or rest in the Lord's presence. We can either waste our time worrying or trust in the Lord to take care of us. We 
we may take off. We need to take off the yoke that so heavily burdened us and take on this new yoke. The new yoke from him. Take on this new yoke. Put it on from him. The one that doesn't judge but leads to repentance. The one that becomes your strength in times of weakness. We can rest in the Lord by taking everything, all our burdens, problems, and anxieties to him in prayer. We can tell God what we need, even as we remember and thank him for all that he has done already. As we do this, as we abide in Jesus Christ and God's presence, he promises to pour out his supernatural and incomprehensible peace to guard our hearts, as it says in Philippians 4, from verse 4 to 7. We learn from Christ and begin to emulate him. We recognize that we are not alone. Out of control emotions fueled by fear and anxiety may lead us to feel alone and isolated. But you see, once you accept the invitation, you then you realize that I am not walking alone. I am surrounded by him. I am covered by him. When storms rage around me still, I can go to him and say, Lord, I am resting at your feet. I am resting at your feet. Right here and now, we can quieten ourselves we can be still and surrender ourselves to the Lord. We can see him as Isaiah did, high and lifted up. He is sovereign over the whole earth, over our lives, and over every enemy, both internal and external, human and spiritual. We can peacefully wait on him, we can steadfastly, we can be steadfast, longing and always looking to him for help. This is how we rest in the Lord. As we take a moment just to reflect, right here and now, may we question ourselves, may we be still, may we make the individual choice at this moment to accept the invitation. To accept the invitation to rest in him. Dear Heavenly Father, we recognize who you are in our lives, Lord. Father of all creations, Lord God, we accept the invitations for you alone have invited us. So here we are, oh Father God, saying, Lord, for many times and many moments, oh Father God, we may have tried to control things that are yours to control, Lord. For many times, oh Father God, when we have accepted the invitation, we may still have not let go of the illusion of control, oh Father God, and still wanted to be in control. But we come this morning, O oh Father God, to rest and rest in your presence, Lord. We are accepting the invitation. And wherever you are right now, you can just say a prayer to accept the invitation if you are willing to. For it doesn't matter how dirty you are, how tainted you may think you are, the invite remains for you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.